I have a ton of pictures to show you, probably, you know, more than you can remember or whatever. And, uh, Take notes. <clears throat> yeah. It this is an official loosely, class, so you're responsible for this. Loosely tied together with some words. Um, technically, I'm a forensic anthropologist. Um, my degree is in illustration, but I just had a major obsession with anatomy, biology, human evolution. Um, Dinosaurs, pretty cool, but they don't really tell the story of us, and I just really find um, human origins kind of really tied into uh, probably like the most important story to be really actively involved in. So I, at one point, decided to dedicate all my work and efforts into kind of illustrating the hell out of it as best as I could. Um, so, you know, um, what is forensic reconstruction? Well, there's a lot of you know, different whatever definitions, um, you know, um, generally it's, my definition for it is it's a best guess using as much evidence and understanding of many, as many different disciplines as possible to uh, describe an approximation of what someone or something looked like when they were alive. Um, and, you know, you can learn a lot from just a simple skull. Um, there's, you can figure out the very closely a lot of anatomy. Uh, there's a ton of markers on skulls, especially if they're well preserved that you can see where to kind of start with. Um, as far as application of muscles, um, muscle patterns, and sort, uh, origins and insertions. Um, but, uh, you know, there's actually forensic reconstruction kind of goes way back. You know, I would even consider people working back before the Renaissance and Giotto and Vinci, kind of reconstructionist because they're trying to describe stories, biblical stories or whatever, but more or less, um, you know, using anatomy, using science and techniques to really kind of, uh, you know, paint a picture, illustrate what these people look like, these stories, um, and uh, yeah. So le legend such as the one, those who wrote legends of such things, the Cyclops would also, would also come. Yeah, I suppose, you know, um, you know, those are the kind of things where, you know, Greeks and Romans going into northern Africa, finding these giant skulls, you know, and not getting it 100% right, you know, because there's a lot of misunderstanding. But, yeah, more or less, you know, um, in ancient China, you know, they're finding a lot of dinosaur bones, so you have a lot of lore of dragons and giant serpents and stuff that kind of come about. Um, but, you know, so as times progressed and, you know, Things like um, uh, cadavers and um, you know studying the dead became more of an accepted thing, and people didn't have to break into you know morgues and dig bodies up from the ground um, like Da Vinci had to do back in the day. You know, um, it opened up a lot more understanding and study. Um, you know, the thing about this is that it's 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 as much of an exact science as you can make it. Um, and which, which to say, it, it kind of, it isn't in a way, because it always comes down to, you know, the individual making the piece, their understanding of whatever, um, and the processes that they're using to, to bring this thing back to life. Um, and so, you know, um, there's, a, there's a lot of issues with it, tissue depth thickness, um, you know, there's been a lot of literature written about it, but me and my personal work, I've actually gone out to downstate medical to do dissections of cadavers and um, taking notes and studying kind of various ethnicities um, to get a rough idea of more or less how things should look um, and how to think about everything. Um, you know, um, it, it varies from culture to culture, and even when you do get a skull, you know, it's it's hard to say exactly like okay, you know, this is what this person looked like. You need to understand sort of where the skull was found, um, you know, more or less the age of the individual, the sex of the individual, um, any, any evidence of what type of lifestyle they live, food sources available, water sources available, um, you know, climate, the geology, the geography, all these things end up affecting, you know, the individual. I had to do a test back in, when I was working under uh, Ian Tattersall and people at the Museum of Natural History. Um, they just gave me a skull and said, 
you know, reconstruct it. And after I was done, they showed me, you know, what the person really looked like. And it, you know, it was a, an Inuit skull. But the thing is, if you just go ahead and use, you know, a chart and not really ask questions about, you know, where it's from and all those other things, it's going to look like a much different person. This, this guy's name is Kissuk, and he just had a lot of facial matter. Um, and so ultimately, that, what really that taught me was to kind of have to rely on other things than just the, the bones, just the fossils. So there's, there's a whole litany of things that you have to ask yourself to kind of put it all into perspective and um, eventually get, you know, what I would even just say is a, more or less a best guess. Um, however, there's been a few pieces that I've worked on that I've seen other colleagues or whatever later on who have done similar reconstruction and they're very close in appearance, um, which makes me feel good because then it's like, okay, I'm on the right track. You know, the idea more or less is to make something, I know it might sound crazy, but if you just threw one of these heads in the middle of the tribe, it, it might freak out and say, oh my God, that's one of us, you know, and, and so that would be some kind of recognition um, as to that person. But, you know, there's been a lot of studies done, like I said, in, in the tissue depth measurements of everything, but. Um, again, that varies because you don't know if you, when you're looking at a skull necessarily if that person was very heavy set or very thin or emaciated. There are other indications as far as atrophy in the skull, muscle, um, uh, bone sort of um, uh, deterioration. You know, if, if, if a person was very physical, then that leaves a lot of marks and a lot of bruises throughout the whole skeleton. Um, you know, and, and if the person had a very easy life, then a lot of those features might be much more soft. And then it goes down to you know, sex as well because you have um, females and males who have much different kind of markings. And generally males um, have much deeper grooves, much stronger bones, and um, you know, there's a lot of other characteristics, even just in the skull, that you can identify you know, person X, Y, and Z and say you know, with great certainty that that was a female about you know, 20 years old, um, and we can get the, actually, you know, we can figure the age out of certain individuals, and I'll show you um, a character later on who, you know, when you look at the skull and you see the skeleton, you know, this kid died about 1.8 million years ago, but we can know exactly how old he was like, to the day, um, because this, you know, his skeleton, uh, you know, he stands about 5'5", five, five, almost close to 6 feet, and when you just look at the development of him, you would say, well, okay, he's probably like 12, 13. But then when we studied the teeth, we found out he was only about eight years old, nine years old, and he was already that tall and that developed. Um, and you know, that means a lot of things. It's just earlier humans are developing much faster, maturing much faster, and of course they had to, uh, to survive, because if you have more of an extended childhood like we do, then in the wild and in nature, you know, that doesn't really pan out too well. Yes? Skeleton, that that person didn't have some genetic disease that caused, uh, I don't know, is it called elephantism or something? Or like microcephalic. And, right. Um, most of those, actual, a lot of those problems can be solved through the teeth um, because the roots of the teeth um, generally in healthy individuals form and sit and curve in a certain way across, you know, across the board. Um, you know, it's a really good question because there was these uh, little hobbits, they're called Homo floresiensis, discovered out in Indonesia. And, you know, when they did the dating on them, they turned out to be around even like 18, 16,000 years ago, um, which is a whole other human species, you know, standing about yay tall. And now the argument was when they found them that they were microcephalic, meaning they didn't have properly developed brains, and that there was some sort of, you know, they had you know, issues with their, this, this one individual was somehow some sort of stunted homo erectus. But then they find other individuals, and when they look at the teeth, the development of the teeth are all healthy and normal. Um, they all sit in a very proper place. If you study, if you look at a microcephalic human, um, I mean, some of them are about the size of my fist. Um, and, you know, their teeth are very poorly, they, they, they very poorly preserved, not preserved, but, um, uh, sort of the, the, the roots and 
the rest of them curve in a very unnatural way. They protrude out through the base of the maxilla and the mandible, um, and there's a lot of um, like a, a pathology that goes along with that. So you know, it becomes very clear, you know, that this individual was healthy or not. And then when they did endocasts of the brain. Um, and the brain was studied and looked at, all the shapes were all normal, meaning that they, they looked just like a very small homo erectus brain, um, and not, uh, because microce microcephaly, for example, there's, there's very detrimental development in the brain. Uh, the frontal lobes are not properly developed, and you have much less folds in the brain. However, this one brain just looks like a perfectly healthy brain, and but it's just really small. Um, so, you know, these are the kind of issues that you kind of have to tackle and, and deal with before you even can apply clay or anything. Um, usually, if I get a skull um, that we've reconstructed, um, I'm just kind of sit with the pieces and look at the skull for as long as I can and just trying to imagine how this thing may, you know, have looked. But um, you have to really then, then put the puzzle together, you know, and, if there's a lot missing, then there's only so much you can do, and then that goes into more of an artistic interpretation. Um, you know, I try to keep it as scientific as possible, but again, you're dealing with something that, you know, could have had any number of other factors involving what it looked like. So, um, and, um, you know, so there's, there's really, like, it's, it's hard to develop a standard something like this. It's, there's, there's a close baseline that you can follow, and, and even through my research and in the literature that's out there, there's you know, sort of a more or less a, a common mean between ethnicities, Africans, Asians, Europeans, Northern Americans, South Americans. Um, but um, you know, that can only take you so far, so you have to sort of ask other things too. You know, and, and you know, when it comes to things like wrinkles and, and so forth, you know, that, that becomes you know, you have to you have to have a little bit of imagination, and if you, anybody says that they don't, I do. But um, you know, the, you know, because you have Neanderthals that are reaching 40, 50 years old, and not using reading glasses, living by smoke and fire, in pretty poor conditions. So you know, one thing that just occurs to me is like, oh, maybe this guy was squinting, so it creates sort of lines in the face. Um, there's another Neanderthal skeleton that looks like it had suffered cancer. Um, and that may be due to a lot of pollutants and smoke inhalation that spread throughout the body, ultimately killed the individual, but it left its mark in the long bones and the pathology of it. Um, and so, you know, um, so then you have to ask, well, if I'm going to reconstruct this guy at his time of death, what, what would he may have looked like? Or am I reconstructing him 10 years before he may have gotten sick? Um, and, you know, you can. You know, a certain skull, like my skull right now, would be more or less the same skull for 40 years, you know, until like my teeth fall out and, you know, my, my, uh, my maximum mandible would reabsorb all that material and, you know, and, and um, then it starts to look different. But, you know, between like the ages of like 20 to close to 50, 60 years old, if you're a healthy individual, your skull shape is pretty much the same. But there's time and, and a lot of things that affect your face over that period. And so, um, you know, these are other factors that you want to really consider. And, and I mean, this goes for all kind of living things. Um, you know, it's easier to do kind of mammals and stuff covered with fur and, you know, you can make like a prehistoric rat or something or a dog. But, you know, the, the, the skeleton is going to give you the overall shape. Um, and if you really just listen to the bones and, and just try to block your mind out, then it'll, it'll lead you in a very close, proper path as to what that person may look like. Um, so, you know, let's see. So, you know, so those are kind of the more or less the, the bigger issues of, of this field. Um, you know, now I'm probably just going to show you some cool stuff. I have, you know, just to give you a rough idea, and so I have to talk to you more about me. I'm just going to embarrass myself. Um, I had one of the projects I worked on, actually it'll be airing um, May 26th on the National Geographic Channel. I worked um, with uh, this fossil that was found from Morocco of a 108,000-year-old uh, child. Um,